So, um, you know, when I heard this was a, a sort of TED-like talk, I thought, I was talking with Sean at BizNow, and I was like, oh my God, those always have this like massive hook, like some guy comes up and he's like, well, it wasn't until I was faced with either starving to death or chewing my own arm off that I thought about eating organic. And I'm the guy who's like driving there and ticked off because some guy cut me off and he just vaporized a minute of my life. And I get there and there's this one-armed, self-cannibalized dude whose foundation gave away two million free organic meals last year. And, you know, what am I doing? And Sean said, have you ever heard of This Is Water? And I have heard of This Is Water. And it's fascinating to me because I had just recommended it to my son. He said, Dad, I have to give my eighth grade graduation speech. What should I do? And I gave my eighth grade graduation speech. That's actually the last talk I gave. And I had this direct parental experience that I could bring to bear on the problem, which is so rare as a parent, you know. And so I just told him straight, don't do what I done, son. And I meant it because I gave the worst speech ever. I was two years away from puberty. I sounded like a little boy. I was talking to the adults, somewhere between the adults and the Nobel Prize Committee. And it was just really deadly dull. I'm pretty sure there's a secret government agency doing narcolepsy research on monkeys with that speech, and they're deathly afraid they're going to be found out for torturing the monkeys. So I said, let's listen to some really good talks. And one of them is this guy here. How many Greetings, people have heard of David Foster Wallace? To the Kenyans graduating class this is water. This is the beginning of it. <clears throat> there are these two young fish swimming along, and they happen to meet an older fish swimming the other way, who nods at them and says, Morning, boys. How's the water? And the two young fish swim on for a bit, and then eventually one of them looks over at the other and goes, what the hell is water? Well, this is a very powerful metaphor. I've been thinking about this for a long time, and I think for me what it means is the ubiquity of technology. It's around us all the time. We're swimming in it, and we don't even realize it. The future is now. So I was reading a book by a guy named Ray Kurzweil. Has anyone heard of him? By the way, I'm not asking you this to make you look dumb. I'm just curious. The singularity, has anyone heard of the singularity? Okay. In math, it's kind of a point at a limit, like 1 over 0 is infinity to a mathematician. In physics, it's a black hole. We don't know what's going on behind the event horizon. In AI, it's the part where the machines get really smart and can think. And I know what you're thinking, like, do humans think? And the answer is, I think so. Um, one of my little guys said to me one time, this is true, uh, Dad, do you ever talk to yourself? And I said, oh, God, he's going crazy just like Grandpa. But I said, sure, buddy, I talk to myself all the time. And, and he said, no, no, I mean without saying anything. I said, oh, thinking, yes, yes, we do that, yeah. So the way that uh, Kurzweil gets there is through three technologies converging, GNR. Genetics, nanotech, and robotics. So I'm going to jump right into genetics. The key is it's a digital alphabet, okay? So you want high fidelity reproduction, you can't make a tape of a tape of a tape. And Kurzweil sort of eavesdrops on two of the cells that would eventually become us two billion years ago, dreaming about two billion years from then. So if I do the math, I think that's now. And they say, well, you know, eventually we're going to be able to communicate, we'll team up, and we'll do collectively what we do individually right now. Right now, we have to sense our, our, our immediate surroundings. We can hunt, we process, we excrete. We do all these things, but if we could team up, we could better detect the reality around us. We could, say, uh, determine pressure waves and, and interpret patterns and call it sound, and we could even get creative with that sound and call it music. And the other cell looks at him and says, music, what the hell is that? It's a lot like our fish, right? And in order to do that, we have to get really small. And the Zen Buddhist ideal is that the small contains the whole. So the acorn contains the oak. Our DNA contains the entirety of us. And this moment in time contains the entirety of the future. So as things get small, the transistors get closer together, the electrons have to travel less distance, you get you know, cooler operation, more efficient, cheaper. It just goes up exponentially until you know, we don't have to look much further than our pockets to find something really nano, right, fellas, our smartphones? They do so much. They replace a cash register. I never thought I'd see that. Of course, the clock, a calendar, all that stuff, astrolabe, yes. They can detect where you are on the globe 
and superimpose a picture of the Earth on your exact spot. You can tie into the entirety of the internet, uh, and <clears throat> you can also control a fleet of robots that are called autonomous or automatic guided vehicles to park your car. You can already do this, which brings us to robots. We have a lot of robots in the popular history, and the list of things that we thought that robots couldn't do is declining rapidly. First, it was computation, vacuuming your floor, uh, flying an airplane, takeoff and landing. Someday, I think we will want the pilots out of the cockpit, perhaps. Um, 85% of Wall Street trades are done automatically on computer. How about a financial advisor that is a robot? Financial advisors don't want to hear that, but there it is in print. Beating a chess grandmaster. How about winning at Jeopardy against not just humans, but two of the best champions we've ever had using sophisticated voice recognition and a process that is, looks from the outside like it's awfully creative. Uh, one of the answers was, what is a tiresome speech about a frothy pie topping. And Watson's answer was a meringue harangue. And I'm pretty sure Watson would call this a boomerang harangue. But um, AGVs are a special type of robot. You basically get the person off the forklift. You can change the form factor. Now the forklift just goes under the payload and lifts it up. And they're ubiquitous. They are everywhere, we just don't know it. Every time you order something on Amazon, that's the Harley-Davidson factory in the upper right. I wish they would load a few more mufflers onto their AGVs. Uh, that's an engine block being delivered. There's Boomerang's AGV. Uh, I'm not going to talk about it much, but the one thing I will say is it's free range, and it's locally sourced. It's the only one that's made in the U.S. and Utah, and it's highly inorganic. My favorite is the Google driverless car. If you'd ask me, you know, when I was in high school 30 years ago, uh, today, how many miles would be the over-under on uh, you know, driving around real terrain without incident? I would stretch my brain to try to get to maybe one mile. In fact, it's a million miles in really complicated terrain like uh, Lombard Street in San Francisco, Golden Gate Bridge, around Lake Tahoe. And the one thing that they can't do, interestingly enough, this is true, is negotiate a parking lot which gets me to the problem of parking. This guy, Bert Swerzy at Rensselaer Polytech, teaches design, and in this article in The New Yorker, he says something really interesting to me. He says, don't bring me an idea. Bring me a problem. And if the problem is worthy, then the idea will be. And I think that's right, because an idea without a problem is kind of the province of late-night TV. It's like a Chia Pet or a Sham Wow or something. But we all know that the problem of parking is real. And I don't even have to tell you why you might like to say, see that your car is 10 minutes out in the queue and then just call for it when you're 10 minutes out. But it's a problem for land planners and designers too because no one wants acres of asphalt and no one wants a cityscape blighted by louvered canyon walls. So it's a problem for developers. If you can save uh, half of your excavation, by the way, the bottom half is the most expensive half, if you could perhaps regain FAR below your height and bulk limit above ground, maybe even get rid of human labor. I'm an investor in a parking garage in San Francisco, and I talk with my operator. He has a garage where for 200 spaces, his labor cost is 80 grand a month. Between that and claims, that's a million bucks a year, so it's really a three or four cap, call it a five cap, it's 20 million bucks in exit value created with a four or five million investment day one. You can't do that with any other building system decision, whether it's MEP, HVAC, or even clean tech like solar panels. They just don't have that kind of payoff. So in Miami right now, we are solving these problems for real. Uh, 480 cars, 12 stories, and a 56-story condo tower. And we're finding other problems to solve. Um, to, the big problem of buildings is stuff. It's kind of a dual problem, right? If you live in a tall building, you spend two grand per square foot for your space. Do you want to store you or your stuff? You have to get rid of it, and you have to store the rest. Well. In a building like this, if you're the designer, do you want to design it so that a trash truck can get in? No, you'd rather have an AGV take the trash out, and that's exactly what Boomerang is doing in this building. It's not something they ever thought it would do. The other thing is storing stuff. You could have a pod for your holiday decorations and your ski stuff, which is on hiatus during the seven-year mega drought, and you can recall that storage pod anytime you want. Now, I live in an apartment building myself in San Francisco, and I was going through my garage, 
and I found a box of cassette tapes, and I nearly threw the whole box out, but one was marked Brian's eighth grade speech. And I got a chance to actually play it for my boys, and they laughed like a room full of monkeys, I gotta tell you. But it was like a message in a bottle from the past, and you can see from this picture just how dire my situation was in the eighth grade. Uh, and and here's, here's my may, actual I'd like to tell you about speech. Some experiences that I have had, which made me think a great I had deal never about heard my voice as a kid before. A famous this anthropologist, 33 years ago. Ralph Linden, said, It is scarcely a fish that discovers the presence of water. I had no idea I said that. I really didn't. I was shocked when I heard it. And I think to that little boy, the future is now, and we are swimming in it, and enjoy the water. Thank you. <laughs>